question I was going to ask you is um, why are point-to-point -point amps considered better than, say, press circuit board? I was a, and am a guitar player. Uh, started in, uh, you know, before high school, actually. Uh, but always had an interest in gear and tinkered with my own gear to a point. But um, uh, back in the mid-90s, I met a, a guy who had a repair shop. I used to love hanging out there and, and watching as he did work on amps and just became fascinated. Through his help, decided to start to make a Fender champ, you know, the simplest possible right. amp. Um, got old schematics, uh, tried to figure out what they meant, what the parts were, where I could get parts. So that was a great learning process. Point to point was, uh, in some ways, the way for me to proceed. And also the most fun. I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of satisfaction in physically putting all this stuff in here and soldering it in. <laughs> You know, we can choose any component. You can see these caps here. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things that's a little different in our amps. These are filter caps. Typically, people use electrolytics, um, which work fine. They're, they uh, they dry out over time. If you ever had an old amp, you had to have it recapped. That's because the electrolytics have a you know 10 to 15 year lifespan. These caps were designed for satellite use. They're polypropylene, hundreds of year lifespan, if not more. The disadvantage with them is cost. They're more expensive, and they're very large. You could get an electrolytic cap that is probably a quarter of that size for that value. Uh, the main cap in this amp is actually this big silver one. It's a 51 microfarad, but polypropylene. So going back to point to point, uh, that allows us to select any component we want to have in there. We don't have to uh, know that it will fit on a board or that some factory that's going to produce this We'll say, well, we don't, we can't accommodate that type of component. Uh, the other thing about point-to-point, -point, as far as service, it's very easy to service a point-to-point -point amp. Things happen, you know, they happen with anything. It, as you can see, you can get to everything. It's all right there, which is, um, you know, really, uh, fenders. To go back to the blackface fenders, that's where I have most experience when I did repair. And I just, uh, compared to so many things that I worked on, they were so easy to get into and to repair. It was great. It's more labor intensive. There's some other interesting things going on that, you know, I have not scientifically proved. But, you know, you've got this sort of three-dimensional layering. Um, you know, everything is, the distance between things is very close. A lot of these components are right on the tube socket, so, and it's the, you know, the resistor is to the socket to the next part it needs to go, so there's, there's very little lead length. Um, and it seems to me, in playing circuit board amps, and I wouldn't say every one of them, they can be, some people will take great care with the, the, uh, the dress of a circuit board amp, the leads, and also there's different, like with anything, you can get boards that are very thick with very thick copper traces. A lot of hi-fi companies will spend a great deal of extra money to specify things like that. Most guitar amps are not that way. It'll be more based on on cost and perhaps generic materials. But anyway, um, to me, in playing amps like that, they don't seem to have as much of the organic interplay, the, the right. feel, the touch sensitivity that hand-wired amps are. And perhaps that's because of this short lead length or the three-dimensional kind of mysterious layering <laughs> that we love and uh, or just uh, somehow that you know the care that was taken to build them these aren't mass produced uh, but they're gonna last you know for for a lifetime I mean there's no reason why this this amp should not last you know virtually yeah, indefinitely exactly. <laughs> Amp maintenance, uh, that was a, a good question. Tube-wise, well, maintenance, there's, there's not too much to do. I mean, just so people know, preamp tubes, the small tubes, should last for years and years. You know, five years, something like that. With preamp tubes, if you start to hear noises like crackling sounds or sometimes kind of a that's typically a preamp tube. Power tubes. You know, in general, we don't run the tubes terribly hard. I, I would think, um, 
I usually say about a thousand hours of play, and that doesn't mean the tube will break at the end of that. It just will start to steadily, you know, the tone won't be as good, and the bandwidth will kind of come in, won't be as dynamic. So not much to do unless you hit a problem, or if you fa feel like you're, the power isn't what it was, or the tone isn't quite there, then you might think output tubes, time to change those. People ask about standby switches. The idea here is, you know, the tube, there are a number of parts inside the tube, but, but one is the filament, and that is, is basically there to heat up the cathode. Once the cathode is warm enough, it can freely give off electrons. Um, the idea of the standby switch is you turn on the amp, which turns on the filaments, allows the cathode to heat up, and then you flick the standby to play, and that puts the high voltage on the plate of the tube, and it's going to start to conduct. The idea is if, if the full voltage came on all at once, um, there's something called cathode stripping, where it can, you know, the, the cathode isn't ready to freely give the electrons, and it can, it can hurt the coating on the cathode. Um, so it's more of, there's the preventative maintenance. You know, how long do you let it stand by? Uh, maybe a minute is fine, you know? 45 seconds is good enough. And somebody asked on our, our smallest amp, the Raleigh, it does not have a standby switch. Couple reasons, one is nostalgia. I mean, that amp is really going for this old Valco Gretsch amp thing. Most of those did not have standby switches. Also, the uh, voltage in there is really fairly low for those tubes. So. I don't really feel the, the danger of cathode stripping is strong. Uh, each amp, almost all of them have 12AX7s. Any amp with reverb has a 12AT7, which is a little bit different. Works good for re uh, driving the reverb tank. But power tubes, we use you know EL84s, 6L6s, 6V6s, EL34. Um, so a big range. But another general rule of thumb that might be helpful for people, uh, power tubes, when you get match sets, uh, it's best to ask for middle numbers. And that just means if you took 100 power tubes and put them in the same electrical environment, they'd all draw a different amount of current. And that's how you make match sets. You, pick, you test them all and pick two that are close. It'd be like a bell curve. And we've found that the ones kind of in the middle are really what the design of that tube was aimed for. If they're in the extremes, they tend to have really hot running tubes tend to be a lot more microphonic, and cold tubes tend to not sound so good. So that's a, a simple and easy, easy thing to do. Just ask for middle numbers, which means they'll pick those middle current numbers. Uh, that's what we recommend to people. So Steve, can you talk a little bit uh, about how Professionals would use, say, car amps uh, in, say, arena situations, um, smaller clubs, various different settings. You know, PAs have gotten so much better over the years right. that I don't know that you need much stage volume. In fact, um, I've had conversations with pros where they're striving for lower and lower stage volume. A lot of people, if they're using big amps, uh, not all, but certainly some, are putting them in isolation areas and doing all the in-ear monitor and doesn't seem like it'd be too fun, but um, <laughs> rather have the amp there. But even even so, lower stage volumes seem to be more and more important as PAs are better. Uh, it gives you a better monitor. Yeah, you know, better mix, mix for so. everybody, really. And and then the um, you know the the sound guy can control the overall mm -hmm. sound much better if he's not fighting the stage volume. So uh, volume isn't so much an issue anymore. You know, you don't necessarily need unless you want a giant stack of amps. A lot of the pros we deal with, you know, 112 combos. I mean, 112 combo is probably 85% of everything we do. You know, we offer 212s, um, 210, 115s, 30 watts or under is what they're after, you know. Even for a big stage, it doesn't matter. You know, you're miking it. Right. Um, so, you know, it's not like Hendrix or something where the PA was just for the vocals or for playing live. I use our Mercury, which is 8 watts, and 8 watts is surprisingly live or loud I can play with a drummer you know in a full band right. with no problem in 8 watts and the nice thing about that is you can you can get output tube distortion at a volume where you can play a, a real club a regular club so it really surprises people to know how loud 8 watts is or 28 watts because um, they're used to hearing you know 200 300 watts on the 
I guess the, <clears throat> the circuit board amps or whatever. Yeah, and some of those, uh, that's a whole other topic, but maybe because you don't want solid state distortion, you don't want that power amp to right. distort because it's unpleasant. Um, which is opposite for a tube amp, which you can do it very gently and you get that hit hard, get a little hair on it or play soft and it's clear. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we do heads and cabs of almost all the models. Um, it's not well known because dealers tend to buy 112s for store stock, but, but uh, we certainly make them. Uh, most of our stuff is based on an 8 ohm load, except the slant 6, you can do 4, 8, or 16. You can run it with a 4 or 16 ohm cab and just lose a few watts. It won't hurt the amp. But, um, so with a 112, you get more concentrated mid-range. You have the nice that it's a single point source of sound, so to me, a lot of times, it's a little easier to pick myself out in a group if it's a 112. With 212s, uh, you have a little bit more apparent headroom. Also, you have more dispersion, so a little more air to the sound, a little more low end. 210s, a little snappier. 10s, generally, will sell 10s to people who have already played 10s. You know, they already like 10s. But usually, uh, I would not recommend a 10 or a 15 to somebody who hasn't already used that and decided they like that. Um, if people are playing in a live band, I'll, I'll generally recommend a 212 because the bottom end will stay together longer. With a 112, the speaker, you know, that's a lot of work for it to do with a 40 watt amp. A 212, there's some real advantages in a loud situation at home or in the studio. I don't think it matters really, um, unless you like the airier sound of a 212.